Good evening. Please be seated. We are in Daniel chapter 9. It should be a long message, as Missy pointed out. There's quite a few pages of notes. So we better dig right in. Chapter 9, verse 1. In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, and the lineage of the Medes, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, in the first year of the reign of I, Daniel, understood by the books the number of the years specified by the word of the Lord through Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. So, Lord, we just lift this night up to you. We lift this study up to you. We lift up our brother Daniel, Lord, as he was such an amazing man of prayer. And I pray, Lord, that that spirit of prayer would be poured out upon this place, upon this people, Lord, that prayer would become a priority in our lives. Go before us here this evening. We ask it and pray it in your precious name. Amen. So Daniel understood what was going on because Daniel, we good, y'all? Because Daniel had been in the word of God. Specifically, Daniel had been in the book of Jeremiah. In chapter 25 of Jeremiah, he would have read that God said the land would be a desolation and the people would serve the Babylonians for 70 years. In chapter 29 of Jeremiah, God tells the people through his prophet Jeremiah that after the 70 years were completed, he would return them to the land. Now, the reason they were in Babylon in the first place is because of their disobedience. In Leviticus chapter 25, God had commanded that the land be given rest every seventh year. That the seventh year was to be the last year of harvest, the sixth year rather, was to be the last year of harvest of the land. And God said that the people could farm and harvest the land up until that sixth year. But the seventh year, the land was to have rest. There would be no farming, no harvesting of the land during that period of time. And God had promised that he would provide enough food for his people to carry them through the seventh year and into the next year when they could plant again. And so we see a similar promise in Exodus when God sent manna bread from heaven they were told not to collect it on the sabbath not to collect it on the seventh day they could collect what they needed on the sixth day and there would be enough for them for the sixth day and the seventh day also until the eighth day when they could collect it again but the people were disobedient to god's command and they worked the land through the seventh year they didn't give it a rest and god had been patient with them for 490 years <coughs> Excuse me. And God used the Babylonians to take them captive to Babylon, thereby giving the land the rest that the people should have given it. So they owed the land rest for every seventh year. So God exacted the rest that they owed for the land by removing them for the land for 70 years. So Daniel's in the word of God. He reads the words of Jeremiah the prophet. He does the math and he realizes, that, listen, we're getting close to that 70 years. We've been in captivity almost 70 years now. So Daniel is not only a man of prayer, Daniel is a student of the word of God. And listen, the word of God first prepares us. 2 Timothy 4.2 says, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. That word means, that word preach means to proclaim, to tell someone about the word of God, to tell someone what the gospel message is, to be prepared to reprove or correct any inerrant false teachings that we come across, to rebuke those who teach those falsehoods, to exhort or encourage others through the word of God. Second, the word of God strengthens our faith. So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of God, Romans 10:17. The more we read about God and what God has done for us in his word, the stronger our faith in him grows. Third, we learn the truth through God's word. And you will know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. John chapter 8, verse 32. The only absolute truth we really have in this life is, 
found on the pages of Scripture. And then fourth, it shows us that we are his disciples. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. John chapter 8, verse 31. It is important that the disciples of Jesus be students of the word, be To be a disciple of Jesus Christ means just that, to be a student of his word. And so God has used people over the years because they were students of his word, because they searched out his word for the answers. And as we go into this passage of scripture, we're going to see that obedience is one of the principles of prayer. And that's the title of our message tonight, is the principle of prayer. But I also want to point out that it is in the word of God that prompts Daniel to pray. You know, when we don't know what to pray or we don't know how to pray, the best place to begin our prayer is with the Word of God. Because it's in, his, in the Word of God that we discover God's character. We discover His love. We discover His promises. And that is the catalyst we need sometime to prompt us to pray, just as it did Daniel. E.B. Bounds, who's written volumes on prayer, said this about the Word of God in prayer. God speaks to man in the Bible. Man speaks to God in prayer. One reads the Bible to discover God's will. He prays in order to receive power to do that will. So God's word and prayer go hand in hand. So the first principle of prayer is prayer is to be in his word. First principle of prayer is to be in his word. Look at verses 3. Look at verse 3. The first part of verse 3. Then I set my face toward the Lord to make the Lord God to make requests by prayer and supplication. Daniel is a devoted prayer warrior. And that's the second principle of prayer, to be devoted to prayer. Daniel set his face or devoted himself. It also means to consecrate or to dedicate himself to prayer. Daniel was determined to pray no matter what. He wasn't going to let anything hinder his prayer life. Now, we saw Daniel's devotion to prayer in chapter 6, right? When the law was passed that he could not, or anyone in the kingdom, could not petition anyone except the king for a month. And if you disobeyed that edict, you would be thrown in the lion's den. Daniel was determined to pray no matter what. Daniel continued his daily habit of praying three times. He knelt in front of that window. He didn't hide it. It was right out there in the open. He never changed his, what he, the course of what he did every day because he was devoted to pray no matter what. He consecrated himself to God through prayer, which means he set himself apart and set time aside to pray. Now, we know that Daniel would never bow to any earthly king, and he didn't, but rather he bowed his knee to God alone. He set himself apart for God and God only. And he also, and this is the most important part, he set aside time every day, three times a day, to be with his creator. You know, that is so missing in our lives today. It's missing in the church today. Daniel prayed every day, each day, in accordance with the law. Not being able to offer sacrifices in the temple, Daniel would pray in the morning in place of the morning sacrifice. He would pray in the afternoon in place of the evening, the afternoon sacrifice, and he would pray at night in place of the evening sacrifice. Daniel would face the temple each night, each day, thinking of the daily sacrifices that would have been offered there. And Daniel, although he couldn't bring an animal for sacrifice because he wasn't anywhere near the temple, he sacrificed his time to honor God through prayer. He set aside time to spend time with God, talking to God, seeking wisdom from God, asking for God's help basically humbling himself before God. But he was also praising God. He was also glorifying God. And my hope, my prayer for this fellowship is that we would become a people of prayer, that we would have a spirit of prayer, that we would sacrifice our time to spend time with the one who sacrificed his life for us. So we meet every Sunday morning right here in this sanctuary for prayer. And most of those here tonight are that join us already for that prayer time, but hopefully at some point the whole fellowship can join us for prayer on a Sunday morning before service. Prayer is such a vital part of our Christian life. It should become like the very air that we breathe to us. 
We need air to survive. Prayer should be that important to us that we need that to survive. And so if you want to study some examples of what prayer is in the Bible, we have this prayer here in Daniel chapter 9. We have two very similar prayers in Ezra 9 and Nehemiah 9. So it made it pretty easy for you. Daniel, Ezra, and Nehemiah chapter 9 are all prayers. Now we know that Daniel prayed three times a day because he was devoted to prayer. But his devotion to prayer also revealed his dependence on God. You know, we go through an entire day without praying sometimes. And it reveals, what that reveals is a lack of dependency on God. That's really what prayer does for us. Prayer, when we pray, we're asking for God's leading. We're asking for his, his guiding. We're depending on him to get us through the day. And when we ignore that, then we're doing it in our own strength. We're saying, I can really do this with my eyes closed, God. I don't need your help. Prayer reveals a sense of humility in us. It's a sense of dependency and an attitude of, God, I need your help. I can't do this on my own. You know, it's ironic when we're in trouble, when things are going really bad. We know how to pray when things are like that. We know how to lean on him when things are going bad in our lives. But when things are going good, we often forget all about God. We often forget that we need him each and every moment of every day. The third principle of prayer is humility. The second part of verse 3 says, with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. Daniel fasted. Fasting doesn't have to be a food fast. Fasting could simply be denying this. It's denying the flesh. It's denying self. It could just mean telling, turning off the TV. I mean, that's a simple fast. It doesn't always have to be a food fast. What a great way to approach God. Void of self, void of self-righteousness, void of self-centeredness, void of self-reliance. Listen, we need to leave us out of the equation when we come to God. We want to hear from him, and sometimes we allow our flesh, us, to get in the way of hearing his voice. So we need to come to God with an open heart, ready to hear and obey, ready to say, Lord, your will be done, not mine, because you are Adonai, because you are my Lord, and I am your bondservant. Daniel put on sackcloth which was a coarsely woven fabric, usually made of goat's hair. It was worn during a time of mourning or humility. And the idea behind the ashes is that it signifies worthlessness, that everything we strive so hard for, everything we put ahead of God, is all going to burn up in the end one day. It's all worthless compared to our relationship with God. So the idea here is humility. Daniel approaches God in humility. And the sense of worthlessness, knowing that we're formed from the dust of the ground. And that's how we're to approach God, with all humility, humbled by who he is and who we are not. When we think of our position and who God is, how could he not be humble before him? You know, I think of, of that cartoon, Horton Hears a Who. Now, Horton hears people talking on a flower. And, when he dis and he's, as he looks closer, he discovers there's a whole city living on this flower. And so he takes it upon himself. Horton, by the way, is an elephant, if you've never seen the cartoon. He takes it upon himself to protect this little tiny city. And so we see this huge elephant holding this little tiny flower. And on that flower is a little tiny town with little tiny people in it. They're a speck on a speck on a speck. But it gets more interesting than that. Because at some point, Horton puts the flower down among other flowers so that no one else will ever find it. And then they become lost in that sea of flowers. And you know, when I, when I saw that scene, it reminded me of the universe. You know, when we consider mankind, and we consider that we're just one person on this vast planet, that alone makes us feel small, doesn't it? But when you consider that this planet that we live on is really a speck, just a little tiny speck, in a universe that we're one planet which is part of an immense galaxy and there are by NASA's estima estimation hundreds of billions of galaxies in the universe. Let that sink in for a minute. So our galaxy is but a speck on a speck upon a speck. Never mind our planet, the galaxy that we live in is a speck 
on a speck on a speck. Now consider man, consider you and I. Just this little infinitesimal speck, not even noticeable in the vast galaxy that we live in. This true, you, you really begin to feel how truly small and minuscule we really are. That we are nothing but a speck on a speck on a speck on a speck on a speck, and I could go on and on and on, but you get the point. We are just little tiny human beings, but the Bible tells us when I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you visit him? As minuscule as we are in this vast galaxy that we're part of, God still thinks of us, still responds to us, answers our prayer, and not only that, but acts on our behalf. That is truly amazing to just focus on one of us in this vast sea of humanity is, is amazing. To, to be able to count every hair on our heads, and some of us make that a little bit easier than others. But looking down from heaven and seeing all of his children in the midst of this vast universe, in the midst of the sea of humanity, and he's mindful of us, that in and of itself is enough to humble us. So we approach God in humility with awe and a healthy fear of who he is. Prayer itself is an act of humility. God said, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to prayer made in this place. 2 Chronicles 7, 14-15. The very act of prayer is humbling ourselves because prayer is going before God and admitting to God that we can't do this on our own. It's admitting that we need help. It's admitting that we're sinners, that we've fallen short. God will hear our prayer. God will respond to our prayer, especially when we come to him in humility and humble ourselves and pray. Verses 4 and 5 say, And I prayed to the Lord my God, and made confession, and said, O Lord, great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant and mercy with those who love him, and with those who keep his commandments, we have sinned and committed iniquity. We have done wickedly and rebelled, even by departing from your precepts and your judges, judgments. So Daniel's now praying for the Jewish people in Babylon. He's praying for the Jewish nation. And Daniel uses the covenant name of God here. Seven times in this chapter, you will see, depending upon your translation, the word Lord in all capital letters. That is Jehovah, Yahweh, God's covenant name. When you see Lord just with the L capitalized, that's Adonai, meaning my Lord, my master, my owner. And so Daniel is acknowledging who God is to him. When Moses Asked God at the burning bush, who should I say sent me? God said to Moses, what? I am. Say that I am sent you. I am. There's really no other explanation needed for God. God is God. There's none like him. And acknowledging that he's God and that he is all that we need to help in, in, in any situation we're in, humbling ourselves and praying to him in that way, it helps us depend on him and lean on him every moment of every day. And Daniel says here, God is a great and awesome God. Daniel knows just how great and awesome God is because Daniel has seen the work of God's hand in his life. Daniel's witnessed miracles. We've all witnessed miracles. Everyone in this room tonight is a miracle. Just coming to faith in Christ is a miracle. Being filled with the Holy Spirit is a miracle. We can all testify that our God is a great and awesome God. So remember, who it is that you're going to in prayer? God. And remember who it is who tells us that he can do exceedingly, abundantly, above and beyond what we could think or imagine. He is God. There is no other explanation needed for him. Jesus taught us to pray. And one of the first things he tells us is to acknowledge who God is. God is our Father in heaven. And that's exactly what we're going, that's exactly what we do when we begin our prayer. We're going to ask our Father in heaven for his help, for his advice. So the fourth 
principle of prayer is always acknowledging who God is in prayer. The fifth principle of prayer is confession. Confessing our sins. Notice that Daniel say we have sinned. He includes himself in that. He's confessing his own sin and the sin of the people. Daniel's been obedient to the word of God. Leviticus 26 verse 40 says that if the people confess their sins and the sins of their father, then God will remember his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And that's exactly what Daniel is doing here. He's confessing the sins of the people. To confess simply means to agree with. We're agreeing with God that we've sinned. God already knows that we've sinned. God already knows what the sin is. Before we even sin, he knows what we're doing. But God wants to hear it from us. He wants us to confess it. He wants us to, to put it out there to say, Lord, this is what I've done. He already knows what we've done, but he wants to hear it from our lips. And 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sin, if we take responsibility for our sin, that God's faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And of course, you've heard me say this many times in Greek, that word confess is in the continual tense. The, it's, a, it's a verb that means continually. So if we continually go before him, no matter how many times we need to, and confess our sin, he is always faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Confession is the key to our Christian walk. It's how we keep short accounts with God. The sixth principle of prayer is obedience. Verse 6 says, Neither have we heeded your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings and to our princes, to our fathers and all the people of the land. The people didn't listen. I know that really doesn't apply to us, but the people in Daniel's day didn't listen. God had sent messengers. He sent his prophets, and over and over and over again in Scripture we read, Thus says the Lord your God. God used his prophets to convey the message to his people, but many times the people would not heed the voice of God. They even mistreated and killed the prophets. And what they were doing, in, in effect, was silencing not only the voice of the prophet, but they were silencing the voice of God. That's why there was 400 years of silence between Malachi and John the Baptist. God simply was not going to speak to a people who would not listen to his voice. That is a scary thought, isn't it? And what a message is in that for us. If you want to hear God's voice, be obedient to what he's telling you to do. Establish a dialogue with him. Because when we do, that dialogue it will last for a lifetime. The people silenced the voice of God because it meant that they had to be obedient to his command. And they didn't want to do the things that God had wanted them to do the way God wanted them to do it. They wanted, it, they wanted to do it their way. And now, I don't know about you, but I've tried it my way for so very long, and I've ignored the leading of the Holy Spirit in my life, and it's never worked out well for me. I find the absolute best place to be is right in the center of God's will, to be obedient to his voice. Moses went before the people one day saying, you have a choice. You can choose this day life and good or death and evil. But each of those choices were based on the obedience to God's commands. Obedient, obedience brought life and good and disobedience brought death and evil. Obedience to God's word is an essential, essential principle of prayer. It doesn't matter if you sit and read God's word all day long. If you don't obey it, if you don't apply it to your life, it will never help you. James puts it another way. To not obey God's words is like a man who looks at himself in a mirror and walks away and immediately forgetting what he looked like. When we look at the word of God, it can have that effect on us, can it? We sh when we look at the word of God, it shows us our flaws. It points out our weaknesses, just like a mirror does. But if you walk away from his word and don't do anything to correct those flaws or weaknesses, what good did it do you? You're only deceiving yourself into thinking that you've changed. Because it's only when we uh, really obey the word of God, when we apply it to our life, that change really occurs. The Apostle John wrote, by this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. 
and his commandments are not burdensome. First John chapter 5, verses 2 to 3. James goes on to tell us that if we continue in God's ways, he who is obedient to the word of God and is not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. James chapter 1, verse 25. So being obedient to God brings with it a blessing. Those blessings come in the form of, I know for me at least, not having to suffer the consequences of the things that we do in our own strength and in our own way. Remember, God speaks to us through, our, through his word. We speak to him through prayer. We find his will for us in his word, and we find the strength to be obedient to his will through prayer. The seventh principle of prayer is faithfulness. Verse 7, O Lord, righteousness belongs to you, but to us shame of face, as it is this day to the men of Judah, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and all Israel, those near and those far off in all the countries to which you have driven them because of unfaithfulness which they have committed against you. The people had been dispersed throughout the lands because of their unfaithfulness. And God was faithful to warn them before it ever happened. God was patient with them. God had been long-suffering to them. But in the end, God was also faithful in his judgment. God did exactly what he said he would do. And listen, that shouldn't surprise us, should it? God always does exactly what he says he's going to do. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God never changes. The whole point behind Bible prophecy is that God is going to do what he says he's going to do. And, he's, and it will happen just as he says it will happen. To be faithful is to be reliable, steadfast, and unwavering. And that certainly describes God. But the question is, does it describe us? What's amazing to me is that God is faithful to us even when we are not faithful to him. His faithfulness, and thank God, his faithfulness to us isn't predicated on our faithfulness to him. When a person is walking consistently with God in humble obedience to him, then we can be called faithful. Faithfulness is trusting in God no matter what the outcome is. Now, it's easy to put our faith in God when everything's going well, but when faith is tested, when things are not going well, that's when our faithfulness really is put to the test. No matter how much we pray, no matter how much we enlist others to pray for us, the situation may not change. No matter how much we pray, because true faithfulness is having faith and having trust in God's plan for our life and listen sometimes that plan isn't always easy to accept is it we've seen awesome examples right here in the book of Daniel when Shadrach Meshach and Abednego refused to bow before the statue they remained faithful to God no matter what they trusted in God for the outcome no matter what that outcome was they were steadfast and unwavering no matter what happened they were going to trust in God Remember, they said, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace. And he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. And what they're saying is, of course, that God is able to save us. That's not the question. But it may not be his will for us to be saved through this trial. And even if he doesn't save us, we trust in his plan for us. We trust that his plan is the best plan for us. And listen, what is the basis for faithfulness? Knowing that there's more than just this place. Knowing that there's an eternal life that awaits each one of us. That there's something better for us that awaits us than whatever situation we're in in this life. We know that there's something more. We know that there's a better place because we believe in the promises of God. And we can say with all confidence that all things work together for good for those who love God and are called to his purpose. It works out for good because in the end, we get to spend eternity with him. No matter what happens in this life, this temporary life, we get to spend eternity with him. God has given us that promise. That's the foundation of our faithfulness. God has kept his promise in the past, therefore he will keep his promise in the future. 
And of course, we have an example of faithfulness right here as Daniel reads that they have been released from captivity and allowed to go back to Jerusalem. There's a remnant that is faithful to return to the holy city. Even though they were uprooted from their homeland 70 years before, and they could have easily have blamed God for being separated all this time, but they didn't do that. They admitted that they had been unfaithful to God. They admitted that they were displaced due to their unfaithfulness. And they trusted that God did what was best for them. And when they return home, they trust that God will continue to do what's best for them. And that truly is the definition of faithfulness, to continue to trust God even after you've been chastised by him, even after things didn't work out the way we wanted them to. Prayer is an exercise of that faithfulness, to come before God and continue to speak to him and continue to seek his wisdom even when he has not given us what we wanted. Look at verses 8 through 15. O oh Lord, to us belongs shame of face, to our kings, our princes, and our fathers, because we have sinned against you. To the Lord, our God, belong mercy and forgiveness. Though we have rebelled against him, we have not obeyed the voice of the Lord, our God, to walk. We still rolling? Joe, we good? No. You need a minute? Okay. Let's go out to the lobby. Let's go out to the lobby. We're going to take a